uh, CCM cluster in Yemen is in its third year of of um, implementing community-led projects. So I'd say you already have some interesting learnings on this. So I think I'll just hand over to you, Walid. Thank you so much, Kristen, and thank you everyone for being here. I can already see some familiar names and faces, but I'm happy to um, um, have this chat with you. Um, <clears throat> so yes, my name is Walid. I work with the CCM Cluster Coordination Team in Yemen. Um, it's a very small team, uh, but we have uh, good partnerships. I think we have 23 partners uh, this year actively implementing um, CCM activities. So um, <clears throat> Today I'm going to discuss with you the community-led project guidance that we uh, worked on with the TWIG. It's basically a cluster document, uh, I mean, at the coordination level to uh, consolidate contextual experiences from the partners and provide more than guidelines, uh, really guide rails uh, for partners to uh, adapt uh, when uh, planning their uh, or when supporting communities in, in, in doing uh, projects, community-led projects. Uh, there were um, uh, many reasons to um, to have this guidance before we were operating on a simple one page uh, SOPs and they were kind of um, um, effective in the coordination aspect but there were some um, uh, uh, shortcomings with it. Uh, one of the reasons we wanted to develop this is obviously to demystify a little bit what it means to have a CLP both for partners, but also for uh, donors. Um, <clears throat> the concept of CLPs is relatively new in humanitarian assistance, and it's a bit more complex from um, a system perspective compared to, say, uh, cash transfers or uh, food aid. And then there is a lack of consistent information about CLPs. So even when we were doing some review of the existing literature of CLPs that were or community-led initiatives uh, implemented in Yemen and globally, there was no single source. The knowledge was a bit fragmented, um, sometimes hard to understand as we witnessed, but we luckily had also some good references. Basically, the, <coughs> the experiences from partners, but also the guidance uh, from the coordination, uh, community coordination toolbox. They were both good uh, reference points for us. Um, so, yeah, so as, although they might seem self-explanatory, but uh, CLPs are not very specific, so they can refer to so small scale initiatives similarly to similar to what we do at CCM, to large scale development programs. So it was important for us to define them and define where we can position ourselves when it comes to CLPs. Um, <clears throat> there was also an interest from partners to maybe um, seek opportunities to scale CLPs. Um, I mean, in general, CCM CLPs are, I mean, the funding for CLPs are, are very, very small. Um, so there was an opportunity of uh, having CLPs as a way of operationalizing ABA and maybe uh, uh, having better uh, scale up of, of projects. And for that, <clears throat> the group identified four interest uh, points. So obviously the better definition, better coordination at local level, better evaluation for learning and more inclusion. So that guidance also took these aspects in, into consideration. Um, how we did it is because CLPs are also interdisciplinary and um, they require technical, uh, different technical capacities. So, for example, social, programmatic and financial, etc. So the, mem the membership of the group had to correspond to the best extent possible. So we had obviously the two UN agencies, uh, uh, partners of CCM in Yemen, UNICEF and, and IOM. We had NGOs experienced at uh, regional and, and local level and CLPs such as NRC. Uh, acted DRC, etc. But we also had local NGOs with very specialized knowledge. So we had um, the Yemen General Union for Social and Psychosocial uh, Workers, which have this particular experience or expertise. And they have also a good model of volunteering. They usually attract graduates from Sana University, uh, from School of Sociology and Psychology to also advise and and and, and uh, carry out the work. So we had that aspect. We had 
partners with experience in development, such as the Social uh, Development Foundation in Yemen. So they have also brought that expertise. And after that, we, we had to run it through um, um, intersectoral uh, working groups. So we had ITF or Inclusion Task Force, Gender Network and Cash Market Working Group to advise on specifically on disability and, uh, and gender uh, considerations, as well as cash, cash for work modalities. And how we how we kind of approached it is basically thinking of it as a system again. So thinking of what outputs we need, then looking at uh, the inputs and the processes that can create this out these outputs based on the experience. Um, <clears throat> also considering the environment or the external factors that can uh, uh, influence CLPs, whether positively or negatively. Um, and uh, and then we came up with this first, first draft. It's a very, very early draft. We still, even now we're still kind of developing it a bit, a bit, a bit but um, it's a living document with periodic review scheduled. So the first per periodic review will be in first quarter of 2024. We haven't set a date yet, but it's, it's around there. And that will look at um, the qualitative reporting from the CLPs that will be implemented from now until then and seeing, uh, like looking at how we can adapt the guidance based on the learning we have. Because so far we've had numerical reporting system um, and that didn't advise a lot on, on, on the impact and uh, lessons learned. So that's an, an, a general overview of the guidance. Um, yeah, I'll leave it. Um, I'll give you back the floor, Christine, to organize the question. And Thank answer. you. Um, thanks, this is amazing. Um, do anyone have any questions to Walid? You can just... I, mean, um, I do. Yes, yeah, go on. I'm just a new guy, but I'm curious, like, what kind of community-led projects did you do? Or, I mean, uh, I'm sure you have lots of examples and everyone knows that, but these guidelines came out of some experiences probably, so it would be just fun to he hear the, the little details. Yeah, like big or small, what did you do? A lot of the community-led projects have been uh, so implemented so far have been focused on immediate service delivery. So finding solutions to water because a lot of the IDP sites are still in rural settings. The displacement in Yemen is predominantly a rural phenomenon. Uh, so they're cut off, for example, from sustainable water sources and, uh, as a main uh, thing and, and sanitation networks. So you'd see, I, I would say, I mean, we have, we have not done the analysis so far, but I would say like 60 to 70 percent of uh, com community led projects relate to water and sanitation. And usually with that, I mean, there are also some livelihood projects that I can also give you examples of that. But in, in terms of water, there's usually a contribution uh, from the community, from landowners to dig a wall, or maybe the wall is already there. Uh, or it's, it's, for example, a solar uh, uh, pumping uh, unit with a control room. So in that, uh, the I mean, the partner will identify the contribution for the community, whether, whether it is, for example, to dig the ditches um, uh, for the piping uh, network to uh, do some of the work, um, the labor uh, required, and the partner would identify uh, where their con contribution lies. So providing, say, solar integrated system or parts of the system, really. Um, with the sanitation as well, there has been, uh, <clears throat> in many cases, we would find that the community has already started doing so digging uh, cisspits or um, sanitation pits um, but they, they they didn't complete the work they would need some uh, some just material support so um, uh, that's that's also an area where partners have supported a lot there has been um, some recreational active I mean I mean, we try to group these different projects into different categories, um, uh, but the, I mean, in terms of spaces and the creation of spaces, there's been some um, uh, community meeting places. Um, there has been uh, some support for child friendly spaces, um, etc. So um, these are these are just an overview of the projects. Do you, do you have a favorite one? 
<laughs> I think my favorite, I, I think my favorite would be uh, gardening projects. We've done two so far only. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that they've been, they've been very, very great. They're still very, very small scale. Um, but it's just great to see the pictures generated from that as well as seeing that during the visits. Um, it's nice. Cool, thanks. That helps me see the projects more. OK, yeah, cool. And I think also the partners had the same thing, especially new partners or other partners. You'd find sometimes partners doing the same types of projects and other partners doing different types of projects. So there has been this this uh, question repeated again and again. And, and, and for that, what we try to do is uh, create a repository with uh, uh, as many of the projects as we can uh, have. Uh, so that looks at the BOQs, the design, uh, if there has been an opportunity to do evaluation reports, also that is uh, 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 that is there. Good. Clara, do you have a question? Yes, thanks. Uh, I just want to to ask Valide if he, he could share more. There is a part in the in the guidance talking about the coordination with other um, other clusters, no other sectors, and we see that some of the community led projects are in livelihoods in wash areas. Then, how is the if you can share a, a little bit more the role of the cluster in this in this coordination with the other sectors when the 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 project is with other sectors, no, the other areas. Thank you. You're muted, sorry, Willie. Yeah, so I was going to say that in the previous SOPs that we had, uh, both for community-led projects, but also even uh, apply in community-led uh, maintenance projects, um, there was an approval process that was kind of hierarchical. So look, um, uh, the partner would basically identify the need and the solution with the community, then uh, and then uh, submit the project design to the subnational coordinator. The subnational coordinator will then look with the sub the other colleagues that are uh, sectoral colleagues. So if it's a wash project or it is aligned with more with WASH, then we look with the WASH subnational cluster uh, to ensure that first there is no duplication, so uh, no plans of uh, having uh, uh, this project by a WASH partner. Second, that the um, uh, standards, the technical specifications are uh, sound. Um, <clears throat> and that process we adapted for three years. Um, we tried to also have the same process in this uh, guidance, but I think from our learning and from um, the perspective of partners, this may delay things a little bit, um, especially, I mean, sometimes the approval from the cl sectoral uh, cluster might take a, a day, sometimes it might take a couple of weeks, you know. And so the idea was that in terms of duplication, the um, uh, the subnational cluster coordinator will provide the support uh, bilaterally to the partner, just a confirmation. In terms of specific standards and, and, and uh, technical specifications, uh, this would be done with the sectoral uh, service provider at the site. So the the the, um, the support of the subnational in terms of uh, technical soundness of the project would be uh, up. Uh, I mean, it would be voluntary, so the partner would seek the support from the subnational if it is required. Otherwise, they can do that at the site level or at the area level. And Elena, do you want to ask something? Oh, you mute. Yes, I have a question for Walid. Um, so I have been had a look at the um, at the financing part. Um, they have, um, I mean, the projects that are listed have a very different budget. So I was wondering if um, the partners are giving any consideration on how to uh, prioritize or allocate funding if they have. I don't know funds for several um, uh, community-led projects. How they are going to split it? 
between areas or sites. And um, if this um, has caused any tension, maybe with host communities or, or other sites that felt less, that they were receiving less, or if not, what kind of consideration you, you put in, in avoiding this, um, yeah, this risk, basically. Yes, so what's happened what happened in, in the past uh, in terms of financing is uh, um, is that CLPs within CCM projects would be uh, put as a flexible uh, uh, amount that is not fully earmarked, if that makes sense. So um, <clears throat> a partner would put, that, that's why the average cost of a CLP was also a big point of discussion during the planning of CLPs because uh, especially for partners who are new to uh, uh, to an area where they haven't done the um, due diligence in terms of community engagement and etc um, they would not be able to decide exactly what is the amount uh, etc and 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 also thinking of the program cycle where you might have engaged with the community to do a community-led project that uh, provides better access to water in an area and then um, I mean at the beginning of the cycle that has already been planned by say the wash class uh, partner etc then you'll have to reprogram and redirect so uh, uh what is be, what we've been stressing with donors um, and uh, pooled funds again and again is that there should there should remain uh, some flexibility with the clp amount um uh, and, and and some reprogramming uh, uh flexibility so we've seen cases with uh projects um, that were estimated at say for example 3000 requiring 10000 a minimum and um, so uh, in that case partners might reprogram some of the existing activities into uh, uh, into increasing the funding for CLPs um for uh, <clears throat> for um uh, for tensions with the host community um CLPs were i mean from the from the get go, we 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 had an element of uh, in, uh, increasing um, uh, cohesion between communities uh, through CLPs. So the idea is that CLPs should be done at an area level because it doesn't make sense to have a project completely engaging with community without engaging with the external actors. So I mean, um, uh, being the stakeholders. Uh, authorities etc but also host community um but in practice yes there has been tensions uh, uh, especially when the community led project focused on um, main infrastructure maintenance in the site only. sorry um and uh, <clears throat> and uh, and that's that's one one of the things we also are trying to include in the risk and maybe develop in the review in the next <laughs> In the, or the next periodic review. Um, but yes, I think um, if in the most part, there hasn't been as much as many tensions in, in community-led projects because because of this area-based uh, um, nature of, of these projects. This is, <clears throat> this is turning into Ask Walid Anything session. This is great. Um, there's more <laughs> questions for you, Walid. Uh, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, Ami, do you have a question? Um, yes. Thank you, Willie. Um, I have a question about the handover process. Uh, do you have any examples of the handover? And also, did you have a chance to observe the future of the project? I don't hear anything. Just yeah. Need, yeah. <laughs> Nothing, no. OK, type it and I'll read it out for you. Um, in the meantime, uh, Ruxi has a question, I think. Is that correct? Hi, everyone. Yes, I do. Hi, Malid. Um, thank you for the presentation. Great one. Just a quick question, or maybe a note. Would you mind explaining a little bit 
bit further with a little bit more detail the connection between the community based projects and the area based approach and not necessarily with relation to just coordination but the area based approach in general i think that might be helpful thank you thank you um <clears throat> this is also one of the things we're uh, we're developing in in the next uh, version of the guidance that we'll share with you um i mean uh, i mean how how i mean how we discussed it with the technical working group is that um the area based approach if we think of the area based approach as the framework where uh, participa participation, uh, geographic prioritization, or geographic interventions um, uh, are the uh, guiding principles. Uh, we view CLPs as an, a way of operationalizing uh, 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 area-based approach of having uh, tangible activities uh, uh, attached under the umbrella of the approach, attached to this approach. Uh, definitely not the only uh, one, I mean, uh, um, but it's a very, very key one, and it has the same um, uh, foundations. So uh, participation, um, uh, uh, focusing on specific communities or ge geographic uh, uh, areas and or geographic areas, um, and and uh, focusing on, on outcomes that are uh, uh, um, uh, a little bit more sustainable at an area level. So, um, but we're definitely uh, still discussing the best way to describe the linkages um, and, and based on the con contextual experience of partners. Um, uh, and But that's how what we've been discussing uh, uh, so far. I don't know, Roxy, if, if that gives you enough detail or you want to. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yes, definitely. Um, just for everyone on the call, this was something uh, Walid and I initiated when we were in Yemen together as a modality, as he described, as a modality of implementing the area-based approach um, in general, given the contextual um, elements of, uh, of the specificities of Yemen, essentially, um, and potentially mitigating community tensions and incorporating some uh, community aspects um particular to minorities which which were very specific to the context um and i just asked for this clarification given the fact that the project has uh, developed quite a lot uh, since it was initiated just because it might be very interesting for elena and colleagues to to hear um due to the development of the area-based approach training and potential incorporation of this as a modality as well alongside the, the other modalities such as, uh, you know, mobile teams and so on. So thank you very much, Walid and colleagues. That's, yeah, that's a great point. Um, thanks for raising that, Ruxin uh, and Walid. Um, and, um, and although these are the, the guidelines or the guide rails, for Yemen are developed for the Yemen uh, context. I think they can easily be adapted for other contexts as well. Um, so yeah, um, I think this is why we have many questions. So Emmy, um, she's asking in the chat, did you have any examples that the CLP was handed over to the community? What were your observations medium to long term and how did it affect the community dynamics? Yes, uh, we have examples of uh, of um, handovers. Um, <clears throat> so I could give you two examples. One of them would be um, temporary classrooms. Um, these were handed over uh, to community for upkeep and to the, the office of local, the local office of Ministry of Education for maintaining uh, uh, teaching cadre. Um, <clears throat> the computer, uh, I mean, the, the, this was done in apps specifically. The uh, Office of Education could not support with the curriculum. So we, that, that part also we had to look into and we found LIMPO, one of the agencies of the protect, uh, of uh, education cluster that were able to, to, to uh, at least secure curriculum. Uh, for uh, uh, for the the following year, the problem we have, and it is linked with the how the humanitarian cycle is designed, is that um, 
I mean, in the past, we used to prioritize continuity in the sites for this uh, uh, purpose and for other purposes uh, so that we can see and measure, learn from uh, our interventions in the medium and the long term. But the reality is that we cannot sustain that uh, anymore. So we still have many challenges with uh, going back to the site like a year later or the even the next year or a few months later to um, to see how how well the the, the project is functioning, um, and um, uh, and this is something also we're looking into with the two uh, annexes of the uh, of the guidance and on monitoring and evaluation. Um, <clears throat> I think, yeah, I think that what we want to also learn, uh, um, or what what we want to imp to do in this guidance is exactly that. So having some measurement at, at least at the midterm to understand um, uh, and learn from the um, projects. Thanks. Um, I also have a question, Walid, if I may. Um, um, both to you and also to anyone else who's here who has uh, experience with them uh, implementing community -led projects. Um, if you share the um, the amount, um, so the information about the amount, if you told the community group that you're working with and doing the planning of the CLP with how much um, money they could access for the project in advance um, when you were like at the very first steps when you're trying to assess you know, what are the problems they want to address um, um, and trying to prioritize the, the issues, were they already told about the amount that uh, was available and how did that work out if you did yeah i mean um, i would probably answer this with many assumptions because uh, and from the coordination aspect it's uh, it's it's hard to say and, and we haven't uh, uh, collected that information from partners who are actually with the community and and inform them and informing them about the amount um, um what uh, I can assume is that the solutions from I mean there are there are different solutions to different problems brought up and means uh, brainstormed by the community and then the partner would see uh, which one uh, they can contribute to and that's usually I mean because sometimes we have uh, 3000 programmed for one CLP um, and we would find that the partner uh, is doing two CLPs with that amount. Uh, so I assume that either the partner is, is informing the uh, community in advance and then they provide different solutions within that costing or, um, or, or it's the other way around. So collecting the solutions and seeing, uh, seeing what we can do with our resources. But yeah, I hoped one of the partners was here to also get more accurate information from their experience. Are there any of the partners here? Let me see. Henry, you might have some experience with some NRC in Nigeria. Or Sudan. Yes, uh, Christ uh, Christine, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, if I understand you, uh, you, your question was regarding if we inform uh, the beneficiaries about the total budget we have for CNP ahead of time. Is that, is that your question? Yeah. Yes, yes, actually, uh, initially, uh, we, we didn't inform them, but it was really chaotic because uh, most of the ideas uh, went over budget. For me, I found it uh, personally, it's, it's actually good you inform them ahead of time to plan so that they are able to come up with ideas which are within your budget limits. So uh, I always tell uh, my team, and when we're doing CLP in initial phase, when you're in, having consultation with the community, it's good you tell them, okay, we have 10,000, like for example, 10,000 USD. Uh, we have a tight budget of 10,000. We have a flexible budget of 10 to 15,000. So that whatever idea they, they are coming with, it's easy for the selection process, for the criteria. When you're having your selection criteria, the budget also is part of the selection criteria for CLP. So that you don't come up with an idea that costs $100,000. Uh, so, so you, because if you are, if you're bringing an idea, which is an amazing idea, but it's hundred thousand dollars how then it is an issue of to have a, that amount of money to fund it. So it's easy 
So it helps you uh, as a selection way of, as a way of filtering what projects you could do as CLP for the community, even though, so you give the community the budget, they go and, and consult together and say, okay, okay, we can do this with this, we can do this with this. So this is how we do it. And this is how I've been doing it actually, informing them ahead of time during the preparation phase to work with this amount of money. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. Yeah, that's, it sounds like it makes sense. And Elena was giving the same um, um, answer in the chat that uh, maybe you want to, to, to say it yourself, Elena. Yeah, no, exactly what Eri said. Uh, so um, when I um, uh, implemented community-led project, um, we were always giving indicative budget as, a, as one of the criteria uh, to make sure that the community could uh, come up with ideas that were within budget, budget, then obviously like you have to be flexible because what you think might cost 1,500, maybe will cost a bit more, but yeah, just to, to give them that range that you know is available so so that we also don't raise expectation um yeah and they don't come and ask for an hospital which is something that doesn't cost 1500 usd and yeah. also like i mean in a way when when then there is a capacity building involved just to make sure that like you also allocate this uh, before to make sure that you also have that um, that money uh, ready not only for the um, components that you might have to buy for the community led project but also for the capacity building component for um, uh, like to implement it like the first time I did it we bought a uh, donkey for the women. Um, in the in the refugee camp, I was working to uh, to be used as an ambulance, and uh, we also had to do some uh, training um, with the FSL team, um, with the FSL service provider, so that they could know how to keep in order the the money that was related to the management of the donkey and like running donkey costs, I guess. Um, so yeah, just to, to make sure you also account for this when when you plan for the community led project. Yeah, good point. Um, it's also um, keeping in line with transparency when it comes to um, working with the communities. Um, although there are of course different different risks in different contexts um, around this as well. Um, Namir, do you want to um, unmute yourself and and, and uh, ask the question? Or do you want me to? Namir is asking uh, in the chat. Hello. Hi. You Hi. can you can hear me now? Yes. Hello, everyone. It's always nice to have this chat on with me. So. Yes, uh, in in some situation like when we give the exact numbers to the to the uh, the exact figures of the budgets to the community, and then we face then like a, a certain challenge. So we need to reallocate some of these grants, um, and including the community led project grant. So we were in a bad situation or embarrassing situation about how to explain to the community what's happening. Uh, also, uh, like it's so we end up like we are not giving the exact figure, but we are giving an estimates between this amount to this amount. So they can like we can have a plan, but still it's an estimated one uh, to avoid being in, a, in, in such situation. But if you have like a certain budget, which is 100 percent in short, that would be much better to give exactly the number. So it will be much easier to plan like the community can have more flexibility to plan over. Thanks, Namir. Yeah, <laughs> these are um, good, good uh, risk mitigation points. Um, do anyone else have any questions for Walid or anyone here or want to share any experiences? I can't see all of you um, at the same time. 
I don't see any hands raised at the I moment. Yes, Kevin. I'll just say something to fill the void, but um, thank you. <laughs> I mean, uh, so I'm recently joined like the HQ team for IOM CCCM, but I was doing camp management uh, last time was like five years ago, but I was, you know, doing it. And I, we, I don't know when all this really started, but we weren't really talking about this kind of in depth community led projects back then. And I just want to say it's like really cool to hear these ideas because I wish we'd done more of it then. It certainly wasn't its own budget line. And if the community had an idea, it was like, well, you know, we have our priority. I don't know. It's just I just want to say it's really cool to hear all these things happening as someone who's kind of coming back to CCCM after, well, five years away from it. So yeah, very cool stuff. Uh, it's the right thing, I think, you know. The community knows the solution is the best always. That's all. It's fun to listen to. Thanks yeah, great for ideas. Raising this. Yeah, I agree. And I think there has been a shift in um, um, in um, flexibility, you know, from both organizations or and owners um, in allowing this um, to happen, and um, and also seeing, you know, the CCM sectors skills around this and and uh, um, and utilizing them and uh, and thanks to you know the, um, um, platforms like the the cluster in in Yemen kind of uh, developing these materials and um, and the examples from the community coordination toolbox as well we can show the donors that you know this is this is uh, something that really works and uh, it is uh, it's a great modality for for um, community participation. I think. Um, yes, Clara. Hi, hi, Christine. Uh, yeah, you hi. can hear me. Yes. Uh, and hi, everyone. I just want to share that uh, we we could also think in the other way around. No, I I was remembering Brazil. We had the opportunity to. To, with cons, uh, consenting the the community, uh, we we could include their their projects in the uh, in the uh, their ideas in the projects or their community led projects in our um, resource mobilization, and that was really nice because we could uh, for sure no after <laughs> after some some years to to get this communication that uh, we we knew before before you ask for budget or before you design the project what were the ideas of the community to to feed uh, in the project then uh, we we could uh, keep that uh, that uh, you know feedback and the, the budget that they need more more aligned no it's not the same but i think in the other way around yes um, um definitely and uh, you know the the, um, there's been, um, uh, you know, the thoughts aren't new. I think it's just now they're being formalized a little bit more, and um, we can um, um, we can showcase them much better, even to to the donors. Um, Elena, did you want to ask or add something? Yeah, I mean, it's just I don't know, maybe a, <laughs> a provocative question, but thinking about the criteria and uh, what Kevin uh, said made me think about my experience in South Sudan when I was in the in the IDP response and, you know, in the POCs, there were so many limitations of what activities we could do and also the community could do in terms of even livelihood or, you know, having livestock and so on and so forth. And I'm thinking, you know, all these examples I see from Yemen would have not be possible. And so, like, let's say if I would travel back in time and I would try to implement these activities, I would, I would have to give a lot of criteria to the community. Maybe like, but it hasn't, but it can be livelihood, and it can be, it can't involve livestock, and it can't involve this. So I'm thinking, how many criteria is too many criteria that in the end they are not community led anymore. Or when, if there are too many criteria, maybe um, is it better we, we look at other form of participation because uh, because then it's not that you know community led anymore. I mean, it's just a, a general reflection because 
uh, yeah, if I had to travel back in time, because I mean, I, I was in, in when I was the camp manager in the POC and uh, I initiated the production partner wanted to support the women committee with um, um, like giving chickens uh, and, and so on and so forth. And, uh, you, and you and me said absolutely not because they can like people uh, in the POC can keep livestock. So, you know, uh, it's. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so okay, instead made me remember this. So yes, yeah, I was also a camp manager of some POCs, and I remember we had to fight just to allow them to plant maize, like yeah, plants. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. I forgot about those rules. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if uh, <laughs> besides me and Kevin, anyone had uh, other experiences like this, where I think mean, Bangladesh could also be an example where, um, yeah. Um, the, the Rohingya community can be supported yeah. through livelihood activities. So a lot of, out of the project I, I saw in the guidance notes from Yemen could not be implemented. I mean, can be, can't be implemented there, no? So, yeah. Yeah, and is is it true? I mean, that I, I believe so in, in certain contexts. I mean, as an IDP, you, of course, are legally allowed to work, but in refugee camps, which I never managed, legally aren't there some restrictions on the ability to perhaps work or generate income could be a restriction also yeah i don't, you can I don't know be employed on certain contracts you are considered a volunteer in certain contexts and and not yeah employed as national colleagues of the country yeah no i mean it's just um reflection. henry um if you're still with us henry uh, i remember we had um conversations around this what uh, how many criteria too many criteria um, um what's the fine the, the fine line between you know risk management and and uh, community led i don't know if you have anything any experience you want to add um from nigeria or anyone else hi, hi christine Yes. Uh, sorry, I, I I didn't really get you. Uh, what was your What did you want to, um, to add? When uh, we were discussing with um, your team and Mika's team in Nigeria around um, the criteria, you know, the the balance between um, having criteria, um, the selection criteria, um, but not having too many. Um, so, what is your experience in in um, risk mitigation? Um, versus community led um, like Eleanor was saying sometimes it's, there's so there's so many criteria that you have to put down um in order to not do any harm that is not really community led anymore is and then is it worth it as a modality should we look at other modalities for participation uh, so yes uh, yeah yeah actually there's no one size fits all uh, depending on context uh my experience in Nigeria was actually quite different from my experience in Sudan uh, because uh, the criteria has evolved and the risk of doing harm. So uh, also, it, you have to look at it, uh, your context, uh, the amount of money involved, because uh, with, with CLP, the higher the budget, uh, the more possibility of risk involved uh, for the beneficiaries of, of the CLP. And uh, so uh, you try to, I always tell you, you try to find a balance, uh, depending on to make, if you have too much criteria, it's no longer CLP. Uh, but you at least have a minimum of available by the community. Even the criteria should be set up by the community. Uh, you just guide them and, and direct them on, on what are the criteria. Because in Nigeria, we had quite a few number of criteria which were easily to, to be uh, easily set. Uh, but in Sudan, the criteria actually evolved and changed from the preparation phase. And when we were implementing, the criteria had to change. Okay, I think we lost you there. Uh, Walid. Oh, can you hear me? Sorry, yes, we can hear you, Henry. Go on, please continue. Uh, so, yeah, uh, lost me. Yeah. So the criteria has changed actually uh, due to the risk and the context you have. So I don't actually have an answer for you, but you just have to be able to to know when do you do CLP and when actually you're no longer doing CLP. Then you could just focus on other community engagement aspects of it. Uh, there's no really push. You know, people just want to do CLP because I have to do CLP. I have told the donors I want to do the CLP. But are you really doing CLP because it's what the community need or it's because you just want to tick a checklist? So, 
they have to really be thoughtful and decide what's best for the community. Thank you. Good point, Henry. Thank you. Um, Waleed, did you raise your hand there? Yes, I just wanted to also uh, um, maybe share my our experience with livelihood specifically when developing the guidance. It was a very contentious uh, topic. Uh, the group was, I think, split more on the yes for livelihood under, under CLP's uh, team. Uh, a, a few partners also thought livelihood are like long term projects that are uh, that require, you know, market assessments that require a lot of the uh, work that I mean, that are out, out of outside the scope of a small CLP. Uh, however, we wanted to keep it open for uh, partners. We've had <clears throat> some good and bad examples with livelihood. We've had uh, um, distribution of livestock for some people, and that was not a good practice because of the individual versus communal impact of, of CLPs. So we're focusing on communal impact rather than individual benefit. Um, there were also some good, in good um, uh, spirit, there, there was some vocational training for suing, a lot of them for suing for women that uh, we, we failed to see um, much benefit from. And I think in talking with some of the partners, one of the reasons was that the market is saturated. So, um, uh, if, and, and the products in the market are much cheaper than how much it costs for you know a woman to to produce these things. But there are good potentials. So, for example, in F, one of the partners is looking into um, <clears throat> uh, improving the income that comes from recycling. So, a lot of IDPs, especially for uh, marginalized groups. Uh, are involved in, in collecting uh, uh, recyclable plastic and selling a, a kilogram is 100 reals per, uh, per, per kilo. So that's like a dollar and a half, uh, but they can increase their income fivefold. So getting 500 per kilo if they sell it uh, uh, um, uh, ground as ground plastic. So the uh, partners is looking into uh, either um, purchasing a grinding mill as a cooperative asset for the community or contracting a local, which is they, they, they see as a better option, contracting a local um, uh, mill grinder to um, to do that for the ITP so that they increase, they can increase their income. So it is it is a contentious topic in, in, in like CCM expertise in, 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 in um, in livelihood is not equal among partners, but still livelihoods. Uh, uh, CLPs have uh, we've had good examples from CLPs uh, interventions in livelihood. So I just wanted to mention this particularity. Yeah, um, um, thanks for being able to share examples for everything. You have a very good memory of each of the hundreds of projects that you have been supporting. <laughs> um, do anyone else have any questions or or examples or experiences they want to share? Um, if not, oh yeah, Namir, please go ahead. Yes, thanks a lot. It, it was a question for me. I'm always facing the issue of the mandates between like for the coordination and, and, and camp settings. Uh, especially in camp settings between the clusterial coordination, sectorial coordination, and also as camp management responsible for the coordination within the site. So I don't know how the cluster system will put this criteria for the community related projects within these type of settings. Because usually when we are talking about community led activities, it's not just in urban settings or informal sites or like something like different collective centers, but also in camp settings. And in camp settings, usually, like, it's, it's like I'm all, uh, my colleague spoke about uh, the POCs. It's also something very difficult to, to hold the mandates of the coordination between whom or who is responsible or all of that. So I'm wondering, like, how that will be categorized based on the, like, the site settings. Over. I don't know to who this uh, question is. Um, um, did you work in any camps, uh, Walid or Elena? 
Um, so yeah, I, I hope it's not too noisy. Um, uh, yes, the first, um, I mean, the example I made on the um, donkey ambulance, that was from a refugee camp, like a, like a formal camps, uh, the border between South Sudan and Sudan. Um, I've never done a community led project in PUC, so, and yeah, as I, as I mentioned before with the example, uh, that um, that um, Unitiara had given it a try, and uh, in the PUC where I was working, and and yeah, and you and me said no. Um, but uh, in the um, uh, in the refugee camp where I worked, um, I mean, I wouldn't say there was a big difference um, to the to the other example that has been brought from more informal settings or. Um, um, uh, operations where um, this is a, a way to operational uh, operational area based approach as, as we say define it. Um, the um, yeah the only like we went through through the pretty much the same process in terms of consulting the community, giving criteria. Um, we had a couple of um, um, a couple of uh, proposal that we had to. Um, uh, turned down because they were not uh, going to support the whole community, but just um, it seems a way in disguise to support only certain members of the committees. Um, and um, and that we went through the procurement phase and then the, the training, as I said, and then the end over. Um, it was just uh, for us a matter of monitoring to make sure that uh, the, the the donkey was used for uh, for the for the whole site, um, and it was a specific. Um, the, the the donkey TUR was very specific because it was uh, in addition to the ambulance that the hospital already had, and it was a request from the women saying that one donkey ambulance was not enough, and for the women that were pregnant, sometimes they had to walk. Um, a lot to reach the hospital, so that was just dedicated to um, uh, to the women committee to support vulnerable women and, and pregnant women to access the hospital, basically. Um, but yeah, the process was very similar in my in my experience, and but it's also true that the setting was favorable to to do this kind of projects because uh, there were no problem in uh, in in doing this type of um, of of activities uh, in the camp where I was working. So. Like in other in other camps where I where I work, yeah, definitely this would have not been possible. I hope this answered a question. Yes, yeah, thanks maybe, a lot. No, yeah, it's, it's maybe nice just to uh, like when we. Sorry. Yeah, no, I just wanted to share a reflection because it's linked to this experience, um, and it's. Um, like to be very reasonable when you plan for it, because in our experience, we were able to implement two uh, community-led projects, but there were also another one that was in the pipeline, um, and we had consulted the youth committees, and we were moving ahead. The problem was that then uh, the project ended, and um management responsibility were handed over to another agency, which means that we couldn't then proceed with with this um with this project which was very yeah very sad for us and, and also for the community and yeah definitely not the best the best way to operate so that was a bit um problematic yeah a lot of challenges indeed um, um with sustainability and and uh, social cohesion and um yeah different uh, context specific challenges um but it's been great to to hear all um, all the projects that have been able to uh, been implemented and handed over also, um, uh, and to be able to hear all of your experiences. Um, I'm aware it's two o'clock now, so um, I said it would be between thirty to forty five minutes. So I'm, <laughs> I've kept you fifteen minutes extra. Um, um, thanks, Walid, for for um, being here with us today. For ask Walid anything and uh, <laughs> uh, and sharing this amazing um guide rails um, and um thanks everyone um, does anyone want to add anything before before we close for this month 
Um, I shared the, um, the the link in the chat as well to the um, where you can find these um, guide rails. Is that what you call them? The on the um, on the CCM cluster page in the chat, and also the community coordination toolbox. Um, sorry, I, I was I missed the. Someone raised their hand. Do you want to unmute yourself? I missed who it was. Let me see. Um, Clara. No, sorry. What's up, mistake? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just raising your hand to say goodbye. Um. um uh, well, everyone's saying uh, thank you. Um, um. To Walid and Elena and Kevin and everyone. So um. Uh. I also wanted to just um ask. The hive now if any of you have any requests for um other topics for community coffee and chat just reach out to me and um any requests or if you have anything that you want to share um with the forum um then let me know and we'll organize it so thanks everyone for a very interesting uh, discussion um i will stop the recording and Close the meeting. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye.